Well, hey, good evening, everybody. Um, as we come back to the red carpet experience. Hi, my name is Russ Matthews with Real Dialogue. We want to say welcome back um, for those of us who are here at the beginning with uh, Andrew Hill. And uh, with the same kind of different me, oh, same kind of different as me opening weekend. And so thank you so much for being here. Again, my name is Russ Matthews with Real Dialogue. And we are thrilled tonight to have Ron and Beth Hall, as well as Hope 103.2's um, Laura Bennett. Now, before I go through, I'm going to go through and explain to you who these wonderful people are um, in just a minute, but also just to keep in mind for all those who are live with us tonight after seeing the film, or even if you haven't seen the film, it's okay to be a part of this this evening. We encourage you actually to continue to ask questions. You can send in your questions um, there on Facebook and we'll be able to try and answer as many of the questions as possible. Um, and so just kind of kind of introduce our guests to you, um, even though if especially if you just watched the film, you might you sort of would have recognized Ron, um, maybe in a way if he looked a bit like Greg Kinnear, you know, and you can tell just by, uh, based on screen. But Ron um, is the author of the New York Times bestseller book that, uh, by the same name, same kind of different as me, and also has been an advocate um, at raising hundreds, a uh, hundred million dollars for the homeless. Um, through the different foundations that he's worked with over the years. And uh, he's also joined by his um, wonderful wife, Beth. They've been married since uh, 2011. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. And uh, she runs the same kind of different as me foundation and which raises money for and awareness of the homeless specifically, but we can't wait to find out more about you, Beth, too, as we're going through the evening. And then also up here in the corner, you can see it's one of my good friends here tonight and also a great film advocate as well as a radio personality at Hope 1 to 3.2 and an author. Uh, she is an author herself. This is Laura Bennett. And Laura Bennett uh, has been on so many different components of Hope 1 to 3.2 over the years. Um, at, at nights, breakfast, but currently in the afternoons. And uh, we just are so thrilled to have you here too, Laura. So, Thank um, you. Grateful to be here. Yeah. So we're thrilled. Now I'm curious. I, I think I heard a rumor, uh, Ron, and I'm just going to kind of start this off. Were you kind of thinking that you would have come to Australia during this whole thing if it had have actually, uh, if the whole COVID-19 thing hadn't kind of occurred? Um, that were you, have you been to Australia or were you going to come to Australia at some point? No, it, it has been on our bucket list, but yes, uh, when we first started talking about this a couple of years ago, we were going to do a, uh, with Rod Hopping, we were going to do a, a, a tour all uh, over Australia and New Zealand and promote the film, and uh, that's what we did in America. We had uh, 150 red carpet events all across America. We did some of them live, but I did speaking events in a lot of those cities in preparation uh, for the for the movie, so uh, Beth and I have done. I don't know. Probably we've been married nine years now, and I'd say that we've probably done three hundred events uh, wow. together, speaking events, and I've done <laughs> more than a thousand. So, oh my yeah. goodness! Wow! So, oh, we're so thrilled to have both of you here tonight, and we're looking forward to hearing more about it. Also, Laura, hey, Laura, um, especially because this is the Australian premiere. I know the film has been out for a while over in the States, but it's Australian premiere. Love to hear what your thoughts on it real quick before we kind of jump into it. Like, what do you think of the film? I loved it. And I think as a story, I mean, you guys, Ron, Beth, have clearly worked so intentionally around creating this and making it something that people really value and can really love. But I think I loved seeing particularly Hollywood heavyweights like Greg Kinnear and Renee Zellweger lead a story that can so often sit out, sort of next to or outside of what a lot of mainstream cinema does. And yet you've got these really amazing actors telling this really amazing story, not just about homelessness and philanthropy and how sometimes we can really look at people in different life situations as being very much different from us and removed from us, but it brings uh, an awareness and I guess a new life to the way we look at the whole conversation of homelessness and how to help people and how to do good in our world. And so for me, that as a movie, it was brilliant. And then as a story, it was just so heartfelt and brought so much, I think, that's really important for people to talk about and to look at in how we do actually serve our communities. So I loved it in so many ways. So thank you guys for what you guys brought to the screen because it was really well done. It was Thank fantastic. You. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, thrilled. It was real. It was it was just an excellent film, and my family loved it. And uh, we're looking forward to being able to share it with Australia, especially over the next few weeks, as as people are introduced to it online, in particular. So we're really looking forward to that. Now, let's just kind of get into the story because I mean, some people may have been coming from a position of seeing the film, but there may be some people that are watching here tonight that may not have seen the film yet and maybe just being introduced to the story. So I thought, Ron, if it would be okay for, for me to be able to just kind of ask you a real quick question, just going to give you a brief understanding of it, but just a, one of the quotes from the, the book and also from the, the movie with that Deb had said to you, don't give up on Denver. God is, God is going to bless your friendship in a way you could never imagine. And um, I'm wondering just kind of like, your friendship, how that all kind of virgin is there things that we didn't even see on the screen that even kind of goes beyond well beyond what we would be able to understand and know about your friendship with Denver? Well, um, you, you were kind of breaking up there, Russ, with yeah. the connection, but I uh, that uh, the last part of the question that when you, I guess you were being asking a direct question i missed the last part you were you were asked so okay just just uh, i want you to tell us a little bit about denver specifically about your relationship with him and uh how that uh, and and even was there things even outside of the film that we would be able to know more about your friendship with denver well uh i would say uh and when uh debbie had her dream about denver that was in 1998 and uh, she dreamed of a, uh, of a homeless man who was poor but wise, and by his wisdom, our city and our lives would be changed. And mm. so she asked me to go into the inner city and search for this man of her dreams. And uh, as you know, I, I, was, um, I, I did that only because I thought I was, uh, being, I was paying her back for the forgiveness that she had shown me uh, for a, a marriage infidelity, which is a central part of the story. And right. uh, it's the redemption and it's the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy she showed me that put our marriage back together. And so uh, anyway, going into the inner city with her, we began serving at a homeless shelter. And that, at that homeless shelter, uh, we were hoping to see this man of her dreams, her, her dream man. Right. So, uh, and we'd been there a couple of weeks with uh, just serving the homeless and serving an evening meal when all of a sudden, uh, this giant looking uh, creature storms into the dining hall, screaming that he's going to kill everybody in the room. And she said, that's him. And, and by the, by the time she said that there were about 10 or 15 or 20 people involved in this brawl, this fight. I mean, he was beating up lots of people and overturning tables. And, and I said, that's who? And she said, that's the man in my dream. And I said, which one? And she said, the one who threatened to kill everybody. <laughs> And then by then I had fallen on the floor and hit my knees behind this stainless steel serving counter so I could hide from the fight. And, you know, I, I'm a big chicken. You know, I got punched in the nose in a boxing match in high school and I never wanted to get hit in the nose again. So I thought, uh oh, this is getting ready to happen. I am going to hide. So uh, <laughs> and so, you know, it's kind of like uh, I, I put my head in one of these uh, cubby holes where we kept pots and pans in the stainless steel thing. Kind of like I, I heard that your ostriches stick their heads in a hole for some reason. I don't know if that's just folklore here, but we hear that. And uh, right. so I stuck my head in a hole there. And all of a sudden I got to wondering, I wonder what happened to Debbie. And um, so I look up and she's all excited. She's jumping up and down like a cheerleader on the sideline of a football game. And, and I say, <laughs> and, uh, and so she was saying, that's him. That's him. So I, I said, that's who? She said, the man who uh, is of my dream. And I said, which one? She said, the one threatening to kill everybody. And then, I, and then she looked down at me and she said, and I think I heard from God. Wow. <laughs> that you have to be his friend and find out if, if my dream is really real. Right. And I said, but Debbie, I was not at that meeting you had. With God. <laughs> exactly. and if I'm going to be friends with somebody who wants to kill everybody, I think I should go talk to God myself. So, right. uh, so that night I had a little conversation with God and uh, though I didn't hear an audible voice, I, I believe that I heard him say that being friends with a homeless man was a small price to pay for the forgiveness that, uh, that he and Debbie had shown me. So that for, for uh, that forgiveness and to, for them, I began at 
Debbie's insistence, uh, a five month cat and mouse chase through the inner city of Fort Worth, Texas in the search <laughs> and, and trying to get this homeless man in my, uh, in my car and have a conversation with him. And I would see him on the streets every, every day when I would go by to, to try to get him in the car and he would take off and run from me and go into the bushes and to the, uh, the inner city, what they call the hobo jungle, which was a very dangerous place where a lot of homeless people were camped. And, uh, you know, and I would silently thank God that he had run away because I didn't really want to get this dream boat in my car, you know, but I was just doing it for Debbie. And uh, as, as you know, at five months into the friendship, I finally get him in my car. And that's when we had our, what we call our catch and release meeting, which is the reason I'm here uh, tonight in Australia for the catch and release. But, there you go. The yeah. catch and release is fantastic. Well, I love that scene actually in the film. That was just one of the most poignant of, of scenes kind of going on in, in the film. Now I'm just kind of curious too about that. because. I hopefully you can hear me just fine. Is yes. that one of the one of the things that you talk about, which I think is kind of a an element of your story as well as Denver's story, is that there was a quote from Denver saying that God is in the recycling business, and I actually absolutely love that quote. And uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that kind of about how he kind of did work in your life and also in Denver's life? I mean, you can see it in the film, but I'd be curious from a personal standpoint. Well. Uh... From a personal standpoint, I mean, after our catch and release meeting, which uh, which really it it was sold me on the idea that Debbie's dream was real because that was what what he said. And mm. I might as well tell the story because the first morning that you know I, I got him in the car and uh, we took we went to breakfast and he said, "What is it you want from me?" And I said, "I just want to be your friend." And he thought uh, he looked at me with this incredulous look, said, "You want to be my friend?" And I said, that's it. So he said he's going to have to think about it. And, and that really kind of upset me that why would he have to think about being friends with me? You know, I'm, I'm a, a, a big, fancy, rich guy, and he's just a poor homeless man living in a dumpster, and I live in a mansion. So why would uh, he have to think about being my friend? And it, I was just so arrogant. I thought he had nothing to offer me in a friendship. And wow. yet, uh, you know, I, I just said in Texas, we say that's looking a gift horse in the mouth. Right. So uh, there you go, Laura, write that one down. Yes, I'll do that. <laughs> so the, a couple of uh, days later, I saw him taking trash out of his dumpster. And, uh, and so I, I went up to him and I said, you want to go get some coffee? And he said, sure. So we went to get coffee and he said, I've been thinking a lot about what you asked me. I said, what did I ask you that required any thought? And he said, oh, you asked me if I'd be your friend. And he said, oh, I sure did. So what do you think about that? And he said, well, to tell you the truth, there's something I heard about white folks that really bothers me. And it's got to do with fishing. Right. I said, Denver, I'm not a fisherman. I'm, I'm a, an art dealer. Uh, I'm a rancher and cowboy. But I don't know really even own a, a, a rod and reel. And he said, but I bet you can answer the question. And I need an answer before I decide if I'm going to be your friend. And I said, OK, so I asked him. He said, I heard when white folks go fishing, they do this thing they call catch and release. I said, well, of course they do. Denver, it's a sport. You don't get it? He said, no, sir, I don't get it. Because back on the plantation where I grew up in Louisiana, we'd go out in the morning. We'd dig us a can full of worms. We'd cut us a cane pole. We'd sit on the riverbank all day. And when we finally got something on our line, we were really proud of what we caught. And he said, so it occurred to me, if you're just a white man fishing for a friend and you're going to catch and release, I ain't got no desire to be your friend. Oh, wow. But he said, if you're fishing for a real friend, then you got a friend for life. And you know, my mind flashed back to Debbie's dream of a poor man who was wise, because what he spoke to me at that moment was the wisest thing I'd ever heard on friendship. That's and I mean, right. I just had a moment to think, uh, do I accept his friendship? Because I really wasn't wanting to be his friend. I was doing it for Debbie. Now this was throwing it on me. I was gonna have to be his friend. And, uh, and I thought, well, if I ever heard from God in my life, it was at that moment that said, yeah, take a chance, be his friend and see where this goes. So I said, okay, Denver, I will not catch and release. And uh, that started our, uh, well, that, that was in 1998, and he died in 2012. So 14 years Amazing. Of, of friendship, yes. 
Yeah, definitely. A, one that, a, a friendship that seemed to be a benefit to you but and benefit to him and then also to so many others around the world in so many different ways. I mean, it's gone on to grow to be a foundation that, I don't know, Beth, is it just in the States or is it this a foundation that kind of goes all over the world? Well, it's a fairly new foundation. We started it right before the uh, film came out. So I would say right now we're m mostly in the United States. Maybe, so okay. 911 emergency call and fulfillment center for the underfunded missions. Okay, there you go. Yes. Fantastic. And how's it going? I mean, especially, obviously, there's so much. I mean, homelessness is not just an American thing. It's all over the world. It, it impacts us all. Um, so how, how is it going? How is the foundation going? Well, it's going well, but I'm sure we're like many missions that uh, we're always, we have more need than we have funds <laughs> to fulfill. So we're always accepting donations because our uh, grant request, we want to uh, grant them all. And so it takes, unfortunately, it takes money. And I know right now with everything going on, money's, you know, a sensitive issue for some. Yeah. And uh, so every little bit helps. Right. Um, Yes, we're just trying to help with with the, the food lines are longer. You know, they're needing masks because they're they're gathering together. So it's it's definitely a problem. Yeah, well, it's definitely something that well, is not going to go away until obviously Christ returns. But I think that we, it, it's great that you're actually out there doing that and being a part of it. And uh, you know, Laura, I don't even know if you realized that Beth was going to be here today. I didn't know if you had specific. No, questions. this yeah. is a pleasant surprise. We get yeah. the tour. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> now, Laura, I didn't know if you had any questions for Ron and Beth that you'd like to kind of put forward tonight or, or not. Yeah, well, I mean, as I, oh, sorry, what were you going to say, Ron? No, I'm just going to say, well, the first year that Beth and I were together, we were married, Denver was still with us. So uh -huh. uh, Beth got to know Denver very well. She was a little <laughs> afraid of him at first because he's quite, was quite intimidating, but he fell in love with her the same way I did. And so, they had developed a really beautiful friendship as well. So it was, uh, I was so happy because she came along on this journey with me. Right. To have come along on this journey and never known Denver. Of course, she would have never known Debbie, but uh, to have never known Denver was quite, uh, was, was, was quite a commitment. Because after she met him, she said, at first she said, I don't understand why you want to be friends with him. He's kind of uh, scary. <laughs> mm. But it's amazing because he really, as, even as an audience member, he just wins you over. And obviously we're seeing, you know, Jamon stand in his shoes and represent the character of Denver. But even in that way, you just get to know this guy who shares so much wisdom and drops amazing little gems. Like one of my favorite scenes was when, you, Ron, ask, you know, um, how do you help the homeless? And Or he asks you, why is it that you give food? And you say, well, I'm here to help. And he said, well, I'm still going to be homeless even after you give me food. What you're doing is actually letting a homeless person know that they're seen. And I thought that to me was the most just sort of jaw-dropping moment of the movie that just sat with me for a long time after because I thought, you know what, that's really what it's all about, letting people know they're seen, whether that's a homeless person or whoever it is that we encounter. But I really wanted to ask you about Denver particularly because he is a really abrupt kind of guy. He's very overwhelming. His nickname was Suicide. We saw that in the movie. And I've heard you mention before that he was a really aggressive kind of guy. Did you ever find out what it was that made him so angry and so kind of, I guess, burnt by the world? Well, you know, that was his, uh, in his words, that was for protectionism. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> because uh, when he was in prison in Angola State Penitentiary, which was the most violent, dangerous prison in the world, probably. And uh, it was uh, an all black prison in the 1960s in Louisiana, where he served time there for trying to rob a bus uh, to get 50 cents to go buy a hamburger. But uh, so mm. there were there were a lot of factors in his life that caused him to be that. For one, you know, uh, his encounter with the Ku Klux Klan with uh, when they they put a rope around his neck and dragged him behind horses for mm. speaking to a white woman. Mm. And so he was he was generally angry about a lot of things in life, angry um, that, you know, 
he, he was uh, not accepted by people. There was no one. Uh, he gave up on life, you know, quite early after right. that. And, uh, and he just carried that for years. And so uh, what, what he said in the end, and we didn't, this was not in the movie, but we should have had it in the movie. It was, it was cut out, but even at, uh, at her service, he said, you know, Miss Debbie never gave up on him. She was uh, my stubborn angel and mm -hmm. she kept blessing me and blessing me and blessing me until she blessed the hell right out of me. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, love, I absolutely love that quote. Well, yeah, so if I can, if I can ask, just following up from that, then how do you, how did you build trust with Denver? Because I guess you know, as being a white gentleman yourself, he would have had such a level of distrust, I imagine. So how did you bridge that gap and create a, a friendship and build trust? Well, what most people don't realize, and I guess you can find out if you read our new book, Working Our Way Home, is that when the movie ends, Denver actually moved in with me and right. lived with me uh, for the next, well, more than 10 years, uh, we lived together as roommates. And we were, I say, the ultimate odd couple and who we <laughs> were thrown, thrown together to save each other. And uh, so we built a trust. I mean, he had never trusted anyone, but he also said no one had ever trusted him. Hmm. So oh. I just kept giving him responsibilities and, uh, and, and he thrived on, on the fact that I was trusting him and we were loving him unconditionally. And uh, I had to realize that uh, in the beginning that uh, a man who had never been to school a day in his life, uh, who was a schizophrenic, bipolar, at one time an alcoholic addict and all of these kind of things, and you start developing a friendship and you want him to behave like you want him to be, mm -hmm. you know, right. I realized that he could not be the person that I wanted him to be. He had to be the person that God created him to be. And I had to learn to accept him on the basis of who God created him. And as mm -hmm. we came together and began trusting each other, uh, he had a lot uh, to trust me because you know, he he didn't know what my motive was and he didn't know. At first, he thought I was the CIA and I was coming to put him back in prison for parole violations and things like right. that. So uh, he never told people his name. People on the streets did not know his real name. He was just known as suicide. And some people actually called him the lion of the jungle because, uh, you know, he ruled the streets with fear and intimidation. And uh, so uh, that's how we developed trust just by I would I would tell him I was going to show up and I would show up. And so, but this happened almost on a daily basis, Laura, from the time that I met him. Uh, in fact, one of the first mornings I'm sitting on the curb by his dumpster with him. He asked me if I was one of them Christians <laughs> and wondering if he had seen the halo over my head. Beth can tell you there's no halo <laughs> over my head. So, but I, I was just thinking <laughs> seeing a halo over my head and, uh, uh, so I looked up and I know I said, yes, I'm a Christian. Why do you think I'm down here trying to help? And this goes back to the question you asked, Laura, when he said, uh, he said, well, you know, what do you think you're doing down here? And I said, I'm trying to help. Well, this, actually, if you if I told you the whole story, he said, trying to help. You think putting some food on a plate or giving somebody a dollar bill is helping? He said, no, no, you're saying that you see us, but you're not helping us. If you mm -hmm. really want to help us you got to get down in the ditch with us. And when you, we're strong enough to cry on your back, then you helped us. Other than that, you're blessing us. Now, we appreciate your blessings, but don't be telling people you're down here helping anybody but yourself. That's the only reason you're down here is helping no. yourself feel better about yourself because you probably haven't done anything for anybody but yourself in so long that you just want to come down here and make yourself feel better. But you're not helping us. Let me just tell you that for sure. Wow. He said, Let me tell you. There's something about you Christians that really bothers all of us people here on the streets. I said, what is that? And he said, well, what we want to know is why is it that all you Christians worship one homeless man on Sunday and turn your back on the first one you see on Monday? Wow. <laughs> he said, Mr. Ron, you never know whose eyes God is watching you out of, and it's not going to be your preacher 
or your Sunday school teacher. He said, it might be a fellow that looks like me. Now, it ain't me, he said, but it might be a fellow that looked like me. God's checking you out to see what kind of Christian you really are. You he, said, he said, let me tell you something. You know, you Christians, y'all look at us like we're a problem. But God sees us as an opportunity for the faithful to show his love. Well, <laughs> it's just it's, the, he was the a wisdom wise of that man. man is amazing. What are you going to say, Beth? Go ahead. That he was a wise man. It was a wise man. It's, it's just incredible. And, and just, uh, just as a reminder, too, to everybody who's watching right now, too, please send in your questions. If you have any questions for uh, Ron and Beth and also for Laura, we would love to be able to ask those. But uh, one other thing, too, it just really kind of stands out throughout your talks, throughout the book, throughout the story. It's the faith journey. And you, you're touching on it. You've just started touching on it. Uh, and as far as your, your journey, as well as Denver's journey, I mean, he was, a, he sounded like he was a, a Christian, but yet he was somebody who wasn't literate. Is that correct? I mean, or was it, uh, or how did he grow in his faith? How did he come to know Christ um, and know what he believed? Well, um, as a young boy, you saw in the film, he was baptized and right. uh, his uh, aunt took him to be baptized by his uncle because uh, so many bad things were happening to him in life. You know, he watched his grandmother burn up in a fire in a slave cabin on a Louisiana plantation, and he tried to save her. That's then right. he went to live with his father. His father was stabbed to death immediately after he moved in with his father. His mother ran off. He never saw her again. And then uh, he went to live with his uncle James, and he died uh, of a heart attack while he was plowing behind mules in, in the field on the plantation. So, so many things were happening to him. His, his mother, uh, his grandmother said, I'm, I mean, his uh, aunt said, I'm going to have to get you baptized. So, uh, you know, at that point, I guess, it was a profession of faith, but it was something that was just like maybe if he got his fire insurance, if he knew what he was doing, you know, it was, that's what happened. But it was on through when once Debbie uh, took him away one weekend for a retreat and that's uh, in our book it's a really really funny story about how she went and uh, down into the hobo jungle dragged him out of the jungle and made him go to a religious retreat with all these white <laughs> ladies for the weekend <laughs> <laughs> that's great <laughs> and so it was at that point that he dedicated his life to christ and uh, and it became uh, uh, a walk of faith for him at that point. But back to your question about how did he know so much about the Bible when he had never read the Bible? He told me that when he was in Angola State Penitentiary, the only day that you got off as a prisoner was on Sunday. And you only got off on Sunday if you attended church. So he said, and church could last all day. <laughs> as soon as you were through with church, you had to go back either to the cane fields, cutting cane or do doing the physical labor that you right. did on, on, the, mm. on the Louisiana plantation, which was called Angola State Penitentiary. It was, it's, a, it's a fabled uh, prison in America that books and movies have been made about. So... So for that, they would go from daylight till dark in church. And, uh, and so he said there was only one guy in the prison that could actually read the Bible. And so he would sit under a big oak tree out there uh, on the plantation and read the Bible all day long. So uh, he said that he, uh, he heard the Bible from Genesis to Revelations seven times in the 10 years wow. he was in prison. <laughs> There you go. There you go. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Now, I'm going to jump over to a question here. It, it's, uh, I think it probably comes from all the different things, that, the different tensions that are going on in America right now and around the world. But um, a question from Amanda kind of goes to the whole impact of all the kind of different racial relations that are going on now, right now in America. How's that had kind of an impact on your ministry? And um, what sort of influence or impact has your ministry or your work, your foundation had on kind of some of the issues, especially with the racial tensions that are going on right now in America? 
Well, uh, America has has a problem. I mean, it's it's still uh, there's still a seed of racism uh, throughout America, and uh, and that was, I believe, a racially motivated uh, attack on on this man Floyd. That uh, there was no reason for that to happen. That is, you just were witnessing a murder right. Uh, mm -hmm. live television. I, I, I hate that. We have um, uh, our ministry and, and our, our work with the homeless uh, is, uh, is totally there is there's no room for, for racism or judgment. Denver, of course, uh, a, a man of a different race lived with me for more than 10 years. We've had other people from uh, that uh, are different race and uh, black people and uh, others living with us. Uh, Beth and I just had a young man live with us uh, last year. And uh, so, you know, we see, you know, Denver told me that the best thing that could happen that happened to us is when God struck him colorblind mm -hmm. because he <laughs> said, I used to see you as a rich white man that I didn't like, but God struck me colorblind and I just see you as my friend. And uh, so this was, you know, Denver was in his own way a racist because he hated white people for very good reason. I mean, white people had done some bad things to him right. over the years. And he, he had to learn to forgive and to, uh, to, to move on. So once he and I uh, moved in together, we began traveling and uh, he started spreading a message uh, and as a man who never learned to read and write until right at, he was 70, how old was then when he learned to read and write? When we were at the White House, Barbara Bush made me teach him to read and write so he could come to the White House and read for the president. Wow. 67? I think he was about 68 or something like that. Anyway, we... Uh, uh, <laughs> Incredible. This, so when he, uh, he didn't uh, read or write, he, uh, but he, he knew... God in, a, uh, in an input way. He would make, whenever he spoke, it sounded like it was coming from uh, a biblical scholar. Mm -hmm. Yet it, a lot of these things had nothing to do with the Bible. It's just the way he spoke them. <laughs> and so, spoke. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. As as racism. You know, Denver, uh, oh, he, he would preach a message that it's not the color of our skin that divides us, it's the condition of our hearts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, uh, for him to be on a public stage and be preaching that message from someone that had been so badly damaged by white people in America was a beautiful thing to see him show forgiveness and grace and mercy and began embracing uh, people and having you know white friendships. So that was, right. that was a beautiful thing. It was a beautiful thing. And, and that's actually one of my favorite quotes from your TED Talk. I got to, I was listening to your TED Talk the other day. And I just thought, wow, this, this guy, you to have the privilege of being able to know him, but also the influence he's had on you and the impact he's had. Also, the, isn't it amazing how the Lord just kind of giving you opportunities to get into sectors of culture that probably you wouldn't have never thought that you'd be a part of if it hadn't been for Denver coming into your life and, and how the Lord really used that. Um, it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing. Now, okay, one of my here. This is a question for my fourteen year old daughter. Are you ready for this? Oh, so she was really curious about. It. Well, I thought this was actually. I was like going, "Wow, okay, that's quite a question." She said, "Okay, he's he's written, he's sold millions of books. He's got to produce a movie with Academy Award winners in it, and all this. How do you stay humble, Ron?" And he's like, she was like curious how you that kind of keep you in check. Or maybe Beth, maybe I should ask you that. I don't know <laughs> which is better. But so yeah, they, he, Beth, yes. How yeah. do <laughs> well, you know, we just um we appreciate our blessings. We you know, we neither one of us came from you know wealthy backgrounds, and so I guess we just appreciate what we have and we I don't know, I what would you say? Okay, here I have to say that I was formerly wealthy. You know, I, I have to say that I became wealthy as an art dealer, but uh, but it was Denver and my friendship with him that made my life rich. And now Beth makes my life rich. But when Beth and I started our relationship and our marriage a few years ago, 
uh, nine, 10 years ago when we actually met. So, uh, you know, we gave everything away. We started with nothing. So she could not, pe people could not accuse her of marrying me for my money. So we started, <laughs> with two kids. we started our relationship like two kids out of college. But uh, the money from our book, we've sold millions of books, but that money uh, for most of the time went to the mission that we were building in honor of Debbie. And uh, Denver kept his part and he used that to bless homeless people. Uh, it was uh, a beautiful thing. We write about that in our, in our new book, Working Our Way Home, which uh, is, I, I love that. I've been reading it on the, uh, our Facebook page uh, almost every night now during this COVID lockdown. Right. And uh, so it's, it's been a fun to relive those stories of, of the 10 years that are more that we lived together. Mm. Right. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. I, I, and I'm going to definitely make sure I'm pretty sure my daughter's watching. So she's probably very thankful that she <laughs> answered her question for her. Now, Laura, I just got to you. I, I drive a car that has 176,000 miles on it. <laughs> and, and then uh, it's a 2006. Beth has a 2015 uh, Toyota. I mean, we are very humble people. <laughs> oh, you know what? I don't think she was even asking for not thinking that you were humble. I think it was more of it's just it's just, a, it's just to be put into the world stage that way, especially um, even Denver. I mean, talk about it, going sitting next to a dumpster to all of a sudden be in the White House. I mean, that is it's huge. And so, you know, there's obviously different things that we'd have to have. And so we're really thankful that you're willing to ask those questions. So, you know, Laura, I was going to throw it back to you. I don't know if you have any other questions in regards to the film or in regards to uh, Ron's story that you wanted to ask. I have two questions. One is hey. for Beth, because I think to me, it's something so precious that you've, you've met Ron, you've been able to start this foundation. And in a lot of ways, it's your own journey, but you're also carrying on the legacy of a woman that you never met and stepping into curating something that relates to a story that a lot of it is something Ron has obviously told you after the fact. What was it that made you um, want to engage so much with what Debbie had done in her life and obviously what you saw Denver's friendship do in Ron's life? Well, you know, I feel honored. You know, I fell in love with him. Uh, it was a, a unique relationship, uh, you know, because the three of them, their their relationship was one I'd never heard of. And, you know, through un the unfortunate circumstances of cancer and her passing away, you know, guys, you know, they needed to rescue one another. And Ron needed, you know, somebody to love that, you know, his children didn't necessarily want him to get remarried. Um, but, you know, um, I guess we just decided to get married, obviously, and I just wanted to carry her torch uh, and just continue on. And I feel mm -hmm. like I don't have children of my own and it's it just seems right to uh, to bless the homeless and just keep, <laughs> keep on the journey. I, yeah. I just, That's great. Part, That's so. great. And I mean, it's a much easier I, thing to do as a team than it would be to ever do on your own. I think probably we can credit you, Beth, with a lot of what's been able to happen recently, you know? I'm sure it's helped a lot. I, I say, Laura, all, all the time, that when Beth and I travel together, and we, we've done hundreds of speaking events together, and but I, I, I do honor her for that because I tell people that she has one of the toughest jobs of any wife ever because she married a guy who won't shut up talking about his first wife. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, bless you, Beth. Bless you completely. <laughs> the other question yeah. I wanted to ask, a totally other subject, because, I mean, well, in the movie, Renee Zellweger gets to play your wife, which is pretty cool. She is an amazing actress, obviously an Oscar winner as well. We haven't really seen her do movies, though, like this one. The kind of themes and even the nature of same kind of different as me is pretty different from her other movies. Do you know what it was that made her say yes to this film? Oh. Would well, you think it's because people don't realize she has the homeless person yes. that she takes care of? So she already has a heart personally for the homeless. She, she has oh, wow. a heart takes care of in Los Angeles. Wow. And that okay. spoke to her and helped, you know, she's helped us even promote mm -hmm. uh, CityGate, which is the association of the, the, the homeless missions around the country. And 
you know, she's just active. She just seems yes. to be eager to take an active role with, with the Right, whole. that's so cool. Right. Yeah. Well, in fact, uh, all uh, all of our actors have, uh, I mean, John Voigt, uh, Renee Zellweger came with us to uh, Atlanta. We did a, a huge event at the uh, Georgia World Congress Center there uh, for the homeless. And and they came and volunteered their time to uh, to do that. Uh, Greg Kinnear, Jaiman uh, have helped us uh, for fundraisers for Debbie's mission in, in Fort Worth. So we've uh, they have uh, gone far uh, above just being an actor on the film to mm -hmm. helping actually right. uh, us with our cause and foundation and and every and our the homeless missions that we are associated with. So. Yeah, that's amazing. No, I'm glad you mentioned that to us. I, it's nice to know that they actually had some personal passion and connection around it. So that's awesome. There you go. That's great. All right, now I'm going to jump over here to one of the questions over here on the screen. And since we're kind of talking about some of the different actors and actresses. So Greg Kinnear playing you on screen. Ron, what was it like having someone like Greg playing you on screen? Because right? you were on set there, weren't you? And watching Greg play you. Well, yes, because, you know, I, I wrote the screenplay initially and then two of my friends helped me get it over the finish line. But, uh, you know, Greg Kinnear is such a talented actor and uh, plays some amazing different roles uh, or, uh, always. Uh, he's, right. he's full of surprises when he's playing, but he's so talented. Uh, but I don't think he had ever played uh, an arrogant, self-centered art dealer. So I had to coach him on how to do that. Oh, there you go. And, uh, so every every morning as we were uh, getting ready to film, we would sit there and, and talk about uh, what it really had been like. And because uh, all of the actors, uh, you know, were interested in the real story and how it really happened. So uh, it was a good thing. We, we sat every morning with the actors and actors and, uh, and we would just tell the way it really happened in real life. And then they would try their best to go out and uh, and give us that performance. Didn't you say it was surreal though? It was very surreal. To be sitting there <laughs> looking up on the big screen. And oh, like, it was this? very surreal. It was, well, and it was very hard, you know, because I'm not proud of the guy that I was. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like seeing and having to relive some of those very painful scenes. Um, and uh, it was it was very hard to watch it being filmed. And then because, it went, and when you're filming, you just don't do one take. You do it over and over and over. And sometimes I just have to walk away. It was uh, it was too much to right. uh, to do. But yes. well, and they call the actors by the name, their character name. So they would say Ron Hall. Yes, that was so strange. They say, well, we need, we need Ron on the set. I said, well, I'm here. No, no, no we need the real Ron. I mean, <laughs> the movie, the real Ron. So it was great. Right. Where's Ron? We need Ron Hall. Where's, where's Debbie Hall? I think. She's in heaven. Don't you know? She's right. in heaven. <laughs> That's great. Oh, thanks so much for sharing. And thanks, John, for asking the question. Please send in any more questions that you guys have for for the halls. One of the other questions that um, I had with different people as far as when we were talking about this film and also all the things that you've done um, over the past few years, what is the most rewarding thing out of all the things that you do about with do um, with either with the foundation, with the film, or with the book. What's the most rewarding thing? Well, maybe being in the White House and being invited to the White House, which for Denver was the most extraordinary thing because as a child on the plantation in Louisiana, he had been taught or led to believe that. The reason it was called the White House was because it was only for white people. Wow. Mm. So wow. when he was invited to a special day at the White House, and we were there for most of the day for tours and meetings and lunch, private luncheon with the entire Bush family. And we spoke that night at the Washington Symphony Center uh, for Barbara Bush's foundation. But this was when uh, Laura Bush and uh, George Bush were, were presidents. It was in 2007. Sure. And to walk into President Bush's office, or actually we were in there waiting for him to come in from another meeting. And when he walked in, 
he walked right straight up to Denver and said, Denver Moore, what an honor to meet you, sir. As he shook his hand wow. and gave him a man oh, hug. I love that. And wow. I thought, wow, can you imagine the president of the United States of America mm. knows the name of Denver, formerly the most dangerous, craziest homeless man on the streets of Fort Worth, Texas. And mm. here we are in the White House. Uh, be honoring him. Right. And as leaving the White House that day, I mean, Denver, you'll have to read this in the book. But anyway, he'd said something that was very embarrassing at the lunch, just a little slip up from him, but it was just normal <laughs> Denver. <talk. laughs> and uh, well, I, I'll just tell you, you right. got to share, you gotta share a connection. You right. share this is in your TED talk. It was, it was a great quote. You got you to share that story. I need to know. We were having lunch at the White House with the whole Bush family and a couple of other authors that were also going to be uh, there reading that night. So uh, as, as we'd been there a couple of hours and Denver had never seen so many glasses and knives and forks and dishes and little plates of food. And, and you know, there was not a piece of fried chicken on the whole thing. And that's all he liked was fried chicken. So so we're uh, we're he wants to get this luncheon over with. So he gets this nice uh, knife and starts banging on a crystal glass. Ding, 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 ding. And he's sitting down at one end of the table by Laura Bush and, and Barbara Bush, the former first lady. And, and I'm at the other end of the table by George Bush, the former president and, and some of the other Bush family members, the, the actual president, George Bush at that time, uh, was called out of the luncheon to go attend to some emergency thing that was more important than having lunch with me in Denver. But, uh, <laughs> he was trying to save the world. So we, right. we are too. We are too. But hey, uh, so um, anyway, uh, Laura Bush, sitting next to Denver, said, well, I think Denver has something he would like to say to all of us. And she said, uh, and he said, yes, ma'am, I sure do. She said, well, what would you like to say, Denver? He said, well, first of all, I'd like to tell y'all that y'all got a real nice house here, and I bet y'all are proud of it. <laughs> and she said, oh, Denver, it's not our house. It's your house, too. He said, no, I ain't, I ain't never had no house, so it ain't my house. So she <laughs> said, well, you know what I mean. It belongs to all the taxpayers of America. He said, I ain't paid y'all no taxes either. <laughs> so, so it ain't my house, and so that ain't what I want to talk about. She said, well, what would you like to say? He said, well, really, what I wanted to be able to do is go around this table and thank all of y'all by name and thank y'all for what y'all have done for me and Mr. Ron in our book. But I got to tell y'all the truth. I can't remember none of y'all's names because all white folks look alike to me. <laughs> I just said that to the president of the United States, the former, the first lady, and the governor of Texas' wife was there. Oh, it was, I have never been so, they thought it was the funniest thing ever. Of course, good. So, my life. so anyway, as we were leaving the White House a, a couple of hours later on our way to the Symphony Center, Denver starts laughing hysterically. And I said, what's so dang funny, Denver? You just embarrassed the tar out of me in front of the whole Bush family. And he said, well, think about this, Mr. Ron. I done gone from living in the bushes to eating with the bushes. He said, <laughs> America, it's a great country. Love that quote. I love that. Oh that's my great. Gosh. That's great. That's it. Now, I've got it. Okay, that was that was a great answer to uh, that question. I have another question for you. And this one actually kind of goes to you, Beth. Uh, specifically, now running the foundation. What is what? You know, it is something. Homelessness is something that has always been with us. Will continue to be with us. What keeps you motivated? What keeps you motivated to keep doing this, to keep uh, running this? And just even kind of jumping off of Laura's question. Also, you know, something you kind of come into, but yet you seem to have a passion for. What is your motivation? I just love the story that is keeps people inspired to do nice things. It's uh, when we can actually help people and the stories that continue to come in, it just warms your heart and you know that every life matters and you know just one person at a time you can keep helping um i don't know it just what would you i say, say she loves to give money away <laughs> <laughs> it's fun when, 
Oh, I think they're frozen. They're they frozen, but, uh, unfortunately. But it's, I mean, look, it feels good to give though, right? Like you kind of under, understand that, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. It looks like they've frozen for right now. But yeah, that's great. Now, Laura, um, we're probably going to, I think we're going to be coming to the end here in just a minute anyway. Sorry, the halls have kind of frozen there on us for a moment. Is there any anything else you would want to add if, before we kind of jump off, um, jump off and uh, head off to go at maybe watching the film again? Well, look, if you haven't seen it, if you're watching us have a chat and you haven't seen it, I hope that you do go and watch it because it is such a great movie. And I think there's you, there's so many ways we can talk about homelessness and there's so many ways we can help the homeless. And particularly in this time, in this season, where people are really disconnected from community and where there is such a great need around us in so many different ways, I think a movie like Same Kind of Different as Me really makes us check that we aren't just doing it in the way that Ron said, you're not just doing it to make yourself feel good and, and meet some kind of need for you personally to feel like you helped. You're actually there to see the individual and to see their situation and just contribute in whatever way you can to it and find connection and relationship as opposed to just serving out of a sense of obligation or because it might look good. And I mean, Ron's very honest about his own story. We see that that was, that was what he was doing and he was very arrogant in it. And then he suddenly went, hang on a minute. I should right. actually be here with people. I should be like in the dirt, as he said, actually serving. And I feel like that was the reminder that came out of it for me particularly. And I think so loud and clear, if you were here at the beginning of this session, um, the scene where Denver just says to Ron that giving them food lets them know they're seen. I think that was, again, a huge thing for me because people can feel so invisible for so many different reasons, homeless or otherwise. So yeah, watching a movie that lets you know you can do what you can to help people know they're valued and know that they are seen, I think is one worth watching. And it's a great movie anyway, even it's if you don't want to go think movie. about it. It's actually just a really yeah. good film. Yeah, but I think I mean, that's when one nice thing is be able to come in and say it's just a great film, but then on top of it, it's such a great message. And I think that what you what you were just saying, kind of wrapping it up, and actually even the way Beth was able to kind of really kind of bring it all together and what really keeps her motivated in regards to caring for the homeless. I think another thing, too, is just that's a reminder.